Reports of infections, illness and deaths among frontline health workers are on the rise worldwide. As the war against COVID-19 rages on, they put themselves and their families at risk to treat patients and contain the spread of this disease. Along with the risk of getting infected, the pandemic has taken a significant psychological toll on many of them, leading to depression and anxiety. They also face rising levels of discrimination, verbal harassment, amongst others. Joining me in the studio is the CEO of Occupational Health and Safety Managers, Ehi Ide. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be here. All right. And joining me via Skype from Abuja is the Executive Director of Royal Nursing Consult, Julie Mubu. Julie, good morning. Thank you for joining us on TVC Breakfast. Good morning. All right, let me begin with you, Julie. Uh, the cases uh, keep rising when you look at uh, the number of infections across the world, and not just in Nigeria. Uh, the numbers uh, affecting health workers on the front lines are being hit by this uh, pandemic. I wonder how concerning it is for you when you see the figures uh, that have been perhaps uh, killed by this virus and the infections that we're witnessing now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Veronica. If, if I did hear you clearly, the, the rising figures in the, the deaths and the cases that are uh, uh, positive is uh, quite discouraging because we, hearing, we are hearing day in, day out those that are affected and the lives that we are losing. Up until, I think a few days ago, I visited a hospital here. We had a defense meeting with the consultant and upon getting there, he being in charge of the isolation center, we, we heard him calling out some names and those that were confirmed to be positive. And one of the names mentioned there was someone that I know, but of course we wouldn't be able to disclose anything. So it's quite, it's quite saddening. We would want to ask the question, what are we doing? What are we not doing right? We still get visit public places. We find people not using their mask, not ensuring physical distance. Then it's quite disheartening. And I, I, I have seen some people who have survived. They contracted the, the, the infection and they have come out strongly. They now are advocates talking to other people, but not in the manner with which we expect. Because it's gotten, it seems to have gotten to the point where we are wishing people who are non-compliant to COVID protocols to get infected. Maybe that way the, the, the doubting uh, the Thomas uh, syndrome will leave them. So it, it is quite discouraging to mm. uh, see what we are experiencing every day. All right, uh, let's bring the conversation to the studio now, Ehi. She says this is quite discouraging. And she asked a question, what are we not doing right? Did we put in place measures that could have ensured the safety of our health workers uh, from getting infected in the first place? Did we do enough? I think um, we'll take it back to, to where we are all crying out on the fragility of our healthcare systems, where we are not having enough budget for even the Nigerian healthcare system. I think that's the, that's the point we will pin it on. The, if you don't make funds available for your healthcare systems in a time as this, there's nothing you can do. Understand that health, so when you talk about healthcare response, it's about, it's about preparedness. And if you don't have enough, enough funds that you make available for, for the preparedness to, response to, to respond to cases as they come, you will always be caught napping like we were caught now. But understand the fact that we are not the only ones, uh, only country that is, I mean, like, at this stage in the whole world right now. And you know, in, when we had cases that were peculiar to us, we could call on support from the international community. But now we are all dealing with the same thing simultaneously. So every country wants to reserve what, what she has to deal with the issue as it concerns her people. But now this is where we are. And we found out that um, we don't have enough PPEs to care for our people. I mean, we've heard of, of nurses who are now avoiding, avoiding the, the, their workplaces, those who are working, they're exposed to all manner of hazard and risk. But if we, ha if we knew, what we, what we knew that this thing was, was in, in Wuhan, I think it would have been enough time for us, even if we can scratch what we have, to start making adequate preparation. 
not that we didn't know that COVID-19 would come to Nigeria, but where, when was just the issue. Even at that, we didn't have enough, enough preparation. But that's why you see across the world right now, I mean, as, as, as our today report we got, as at August, we have over 300,000 healthcare workers infected across the world. Over 2,500 have died. According to the, to the, um, to the uh, CEO of, of the National uh, Council of Nurses, we had 1,500 um, incidents from 44 countries alone. So this is a huge number. The world is already short of millions of nurses, even before the pandemic. Now we have the pandemic taking away healthcare workers. It means there's more shortage that is coming into the, into the healthcare sector. And like you see, in Nigeria, we're already overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. So mm. it's a big issue. What we ought to have done, we didn't do them. Now we are, we are in the face. You, you, you don't service rifle in the face of war. Right. That's where we found ourselves. Service in rifles. In the face of war. In the war. face of war. Now, let me bring the conversation to you now, uh, Julie. Uh, you mentioned uh, something about uh, a colleague of yours, uh, that uh, someone you know who has contracted the virus. And from the reports we are getting, the figures and the numbers, we have lost about uh, over 20 doctors and we still see cases rising of infections. Talk to us about the psychological a mental impact this is having on those who are in the front line knowing that they could be infected as well and the impact this is having on the delivery on, of their service yes uh, thank you very much i am I'm quite pleased that you mentioned the psychological and the mental aspect of their functionality as healthcare workers that seems to be an area that is oftentimes, most times, overlooked even before we, before the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. We need to come to that point where we recognize, accept that the mental and the psychological aspect of human nature is very important to their overall well-being and their, their functions and the roles and responsibility that they, they carry out and play. It's affecting them terribly. We receive calls day in, day out. I still, we're recruiting some nurses for a particular uh, telemedicine center and some home services. We, we, when upon asking them questions, you hear, I have written an external exams and these nurses are preparing to leave the country. And you ask them, and these are young ones. So if we leave the veterans who will soon retire, who aren't physically strong and have, uh, are probably battling one condition, medical condition or the other, it leaves us with a worry, a great deep worry as to what will befall our healthcare system in the nearest future, even as we are experiencing now. So they are faced with, if I leave my job, how do I feed? So it's like a battle against save from a battle between saving lives and saving livelihood. So if I am, I am being called to save lives, but I have to leave, I have families to take care of. So it, it's not a good situation or condition for them to, to find themselves. And there is a need for the government to step in because they are deeply being affected psychologically. We'll come back to that aspect of government stepping in, but I want Ehi now to talk to us about the implication. She says some persons are already writing international exams, <laughs> talking about leaving the country, and we see that some veterans who would soon retire, I mean, are the ones that are being left behind. What is the implication for our already fragile health system? You know, the, the European Union community, we're talking about... Um, the EU promotion, I'm talking about uh, focusing on aged workforce. Right. Why? Because they were not having younger people take over the veterans' position when they retire. So they were talking about shifting retirement age. I think if we don't do something very drastic, we will get to that place very soon. Because now she, now she said, which of course is very correct, that the younger ones are leaving. Mm. Then the aged ones, they have, I mean, the veterans, they have a retirement date where they have, I mean, that's as much as they could work before they leave. Of course. But who fills up those exactly. positions is the issue we must discuss. You see, the truth is that when you make healthcare, healthcare to become unattractive, you find out that younger ones will not want to go into healthcare as profession. The same way we make education unattractive, now we don't have younger people going to teach. And this is the, this is the stage we are gradually 
moving into. But let me also, also throw light on the psychological e effects within the health care. You see, when, when we know that when we get infected at the cost of duty, there is nothing that we can receive or can be given to us that we, or palliative that we can receive, it becomes a big issue. Because when anxiety crops in, you are saying you, the, the healthcare worker you worked with last week is infected today. The one you worked with two days ago is infected today. Then you're, you're, you're counting time. When will I be the next? Right. This builds up an anxiety. And when anxiety builds up on a healthcare worker, you are very susceptible, not just to, not just to get harm, but to do medical, to get involved in medical error, which of course impacts on the patient you are even handling. So now there's heightened intention. There are, there are people who work in healthcare who are families. So the family members are even, are even wondering, my mom is coming home. What's she coming home with? Mm. My dad is coming home. What's he coming home with? So a lot of issues, and when you put this together, we find out that it's not just the healthcare worker alone that, that gets also. depressed. Mm. By extension, the family is also going through what you call anxiety disorder. So you find out that this is where you have, where you have the connection between COVID-19 and mental Health. Where of people, not, now you are having what you call the healthcare worker who is a, the, you have the COVID-19 patient who is the primary victim, you have the healthcare worker who is healthcare worker who is a secondary victim, you have the healthcare worker's family who is a tertiary victim. So when you look at it this way, you find out that the chain of anxiety is getting longer, and these are the issues we have right now, globally, not just in our country. All right, uh, Julie, recently um, the director for the NCDC, Dr. Chikwe Hekwazi, who talked about the fact that our facilities, we're running out of facilities to handle the rising cases and uh, that uh, doctors and perhaps health workers might be forced to make tough decisions. What do you think uh, those tough decisions might be? I think for for the medical people, it's I, I, I hear I hear that there's a, um, there's the is it the plan for industrial action to go on strike because right. let's be realistic let's be realistic we live in a country where there is abundance we wake up on the news we hear corruption we hear the embezzlement of funds. So if we are facing these current challenges, it will be difficult for the, the caregiver or the health care of passionately go to work every day. So certain decisions, they might decide that, okay, we're going on strike. Like I said earlier, what health workers are currently facing is the battle between saving lives and saving life. Mm -hmm. Not just for them alone, but even for the people. So certain actions might be taken. There might be industrial action. There might be strike. Mm -hmm. There might be a pressure on the government for another lockdown. If you ask a healthcare professional, they will say we need another lockdown. But if we look at it critically, how did we fare? What was the outcome of the initial lockdown? What did we achieve? What are the new challenges sprung up during that time? So it's a tough decision. It requires critical thinking, strategic planning, honesty, and patriotism. We need to be focused when on When you say honesty, lives. when you say honesty, I'd like for you to throw more light uh, on that aspect. Uh, is it that uh, uh, the government is not dealing with the health workers uh, with honesty? Is that what you're saying? In a sense, I think personally, that we, uh, we aren't being as honest when the government isn't being as honest as they should. If you're facing a crisis, call on the people. This is what we are currently facing. We cannot handle. Then the professionals themselves would put forward their arguments. How about this? We want this. We want ABC. We want uh, new centers. Or we don't even want new centers anymore. Um, Employ more people some days ago. Beautiful facility, but there are no health workers. Is it that we don't have professionals on ground? Are they employing health workers? And we are having cases all around. We're having hospital beds. So if the government comes clean 
with the professionals and saying that, okay, we do not have the funds to, to lift up our healthcare system, to provide more equipment or personal protective equipment. And, and all the professionals speak also for themselves. We need to come to have, have a long table discussion and really be honest. They need to let, if, if the government is just maybe getting superficial information about the state or the challenges the health workers are facing, I think they need to sit down with them physically and hear from people what they are really going through, hear from the professionals themselves. I, I, I don't know if they know how many have left the country. It's not using a carrot or a... I, 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 I don't know what's going on from moving. If they want to leave, if leave the country, they will leave. But if you are asking them not to leave, then what are you giving them to stay back? Right. So I, I think we need to really come clean with ourselves on both sides, the government and the healthcare professionals. Some of them wouldn't want to say much, especially maybe those from the, the public facilities, because, I mean, the government is paying them. Mm. So they we, we're already used to, before the pandemic, we're used to managing. We're used to borrowing. We, we don't have oxygen here. Okay, you're going to borrow from the next world. You don't have plaster. You don't have certain drugs in the pharmacy. You're going to use your personal money funds to, to, to buy a drug, to buy gloves and all of that. We know even well-funded health infrastructures are crumbling and groaning under the pandemic. We understand that. But let the basics be done. We can't be looking for gloves. We can't be borrowing things from one world or the other. We have an overwhelming population already. All right. That's so there's the, more that is required if we really speak to them. Do you would like to react to, to, to what she just yes, said? Yes, she, she, uh, Julie is very, is very correct, and that is the point that we're in, which, of course, last week I mentioned this in this studio. We need honesty from the part of government. Don't, don't, don't pay this service to COVID-19. You know, if you, if you look at or even all that has happened in terms of compliance, government says, oh, this is what we're doing. But government turns back, turns back, turns around and do different things entirely. Mm -hmm. And even yes, yes, I'll give you an example. I mean, we, I mean, you just mentioned the, the, the registration issue right now when we had COVID 19. Government yes. said we should, we should all be, we should all mind public places, but government created public places where people were gathered. So we need to, to come to health, we need honesty. We need honesty in governing the healthcare sector. Like she said, most times, I mean, healthcare workers are the most dedicated employees I've ever seen because I grew from that sector. I've seen situations where where a nurse had to, had to use her mouth to suction a newborn because the suction machine failed. You can't, that is, that is the extent of dedication. You have nothing to use, you use your money from your pocket to buy things you have to use just because, because if you don't do that, that patient dies, your conscience is, is opened up with deep wound. So a whole of issues, all this put together have happened over in the healthcare over, over and over again. Even, even talking about the, the funding, I think, the funding of the, of the healthcare issue, when you go back to Abuja declaration, it has been said over yeah, and, and over and over and over again. But this hasn't happened. So we can't come as government and say, we don't know what is going on, we don't, we don't know what to do. Government knows what to do. There are two critical sectors in this country that we have never given the much attention as needed. One is education, the other is healthcare sector. If you look at the, the annual funding, annual budget of the country, what is allocated to these two sectors is so abysmal that there's nothing we can do. But here we are right now. Here we are right now. I'm talking about the, 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 the loss of healthcare workers. I mean, I spoke to some, some graduating doctors in uh, one of the teaching hospitals sometime two years ago, and I was amazed that out of about 122 graduating doctors, 87% of them have written international exams. They were leaving the country. So what, based on government actions, like I said before, the healthcare sector is no more attractive for workers to come into work because they are not paid so well. That is so we are we training. Begin. Yes, we are training workers. We are training healthcare workers for the West. So they go through a medical school, and once they finish, they have, they've gone abroad. So you have what we call paucity. We have high vacuum, you know, of healthcare workers in the country. We need more people. Now we have many cases, like Julie said. Beautiful facility, but there are no healthcare workers. Healthcare workers. So, in addressing all of these issues in the short term and in the long term, in specific terms, where should government begin? Firstly, we need to firstly we need to make healthcare to become an attractive place to work. 
Secondly, we need to increase the budget, I mean, the, the funding of Nigerian healthcare system because most people finish school, they, they want to work, there are no equipment they have to use to work. Thirdly, we need to review our, our medical college and healthcare training centers curriculum. Right. Some of the things we are doing that are no longer in terms of the new reality. And these are three things we should focus on. All right, Julie, uh, quickly, your own aspect. What do you, would you like to see government address as quickly as possible such that we can avoid the tough decisions that uh, healthcare workers might have to take? Okay, very quickly, if they are borrowing money, if they have to borrow money, they should pump it into the healthcare sector. There are many healthcare professionals on the street without jobs. They need to employ more people. They are laying vacant. They need to utilize these facilities and then empower their build capacities for them to, to manage, you know, for them to work. Capacities needs to be built. And uh, like I said, they need to fund the healthcare sector. So take it as a priority. It doesn't show. So we need to see them take lives as priority. So fund the healthcare sector, utilize existing uh, vacant facilities that are, that are not being used, and then very importantly, they need to create programs that show that we care for our healthcare workers. They are doing amazingly already. They can't do everything. Recognize organizations, uh, whether they are NGOs or so, that are doing different things that would help the situation on the ground and involve them in the process. And let there be programs that would help ease the stress on the healthcare workers, especially mental health uh, programs. These are things that can be done in the immediate. Hmm. All right, so quickly again, uh, he, uh, let, I'd like for you to touch on the aspect yeah. of Nigerians taking responsibility, because that is one key thing. Uh, perhaps uh, you might want to shed light on the symptoms. Sometimes you will get to the hospitals and just say, what, say something else. You ask the, the health worker, ask them <coughs> questions, they deny certain things, but later on find out that this is COVID. I needed to touch on that and also the need for people to take responsibility at a time such as this. I think let, let me start by taking responsibility. I think, I think we should all understand that this COVID-19 that we're facing is not just about government. It's about us all. Government, in, in the recent sense of it, cannot do everything for everyone. We are over 200 million people in this country. The government actions cannot reach 200 million people. We need to start taking personal responsibility. There are protocols and guidelines that have been highlighted, which because government has, has signed into law that have been advocated. One of them is we are going to a public place, wear your nose mask. In, in, increase the frequency of your, of your hand washing with water and soap or use your hand sanitizers. Then avoid large crowd and these are some things we, we've talked about these are things that we can do on our own we don't need government to to help us to do this then when we get home also because we also work within the family side family is a nucleus of the society we need to start using what you call family centered approach let a, a father or a mother talk to their words this when you're going out you need those masks on we, you, this, these are things you have to do not not just that we also need to let people know what they stand to lose when people know what they stand to lose, it makes compliance easy. Right. Then come back to, to what we should look at for just like, like we discussed I mean, before, before we started this program, the COVID-19 virus is mutating by the day. Our science, is getting, our science gets close, the faster the, the virus mutates. So we are battling that globally right now. But we, there are some things you must look at for as, as the symptoms again are changing. We talked about looking out for, for, for cough, sneeze, and all that. But now it, you also have issues that present itself like you have malaria. So what are we personally, my opinion, if you have such issues, run to seek, to seek uh, medical help all immediately. Right. Don't wait to say, oh, I want to treat malaria, I want to buy. Don't, don't self-medicate when you have those issues at the time that we are in right now, because there could be some comorbidity. You have malaria, you have COVID in it. Mm. Run to a medical facility and seek an urgent help. All right. It's a fine place to leave the conversation now. CEO, Occupational Health and Safety Managers, Ehi Ide, as well as uh, Executive Director, Royal Nursing Consul, Julie Mugu. Thank you for your time on the program. My very pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.